Okay, everybody, it's the top of the hour, so we'll get started. My name is Jackie Jacob, and I'll be the moderator today. Uh, I am a poultry extension specialist here at the University of Kentucky. I am also the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension, which is hosting tonight's webinar and a series of uh, different webinars that we put on. We try to put on one uh, every month, so uh, if this is your first time, check out extension.org slash poultry and see what we have coming up. We have an a exciting uh, list of webinars coming up soon, and uh, in November we'll be starting an egg production monthly series. It's uh, targeting uh, county agent, extension agents, and service providers, so it's actually held during the day. Um, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, so I don't know what time that it will be where you are, but um, we have uh, five different webinars on that topic that may be of interest to you. Plus, we have past webinars uh, that you might want to check out. Um, static and echo in audio. Is everybody having that problem or just Tina? Anybody else? I don't hear it. Okay. Multiple attendees are taking it. Okay. Suzanne, a few people are getting it, but not everybody. Okay. Okay. We'll have to. Sounds fine in Florida. So we'll have to go with <laughs> what we. It may be from uh, Bridget and I being on at the same time. Anyway, welcome to the webinar. And uh, today's webinar is on winter care for backyard poultry flocks. And uh, Dr. Bridget McRae at Delaware State University will be uh, presenting. So uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, just type it in the chat box and we'll make sure that uh, you'll get your uh, question answered. Go ahead, Bridget. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Jacob. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. and. Um, I will keep my eye on the chat room, but hopefully you will as well, Dr. Jacob, in case I miss a question or two as I go through the presentation. Uh, feel free to, ch to type your questions in and we will get them answered as best we can. Uh, but here we are. It's turning into fall around here. I'm, I'm in Delaware and it has rained all day. And it's very much beginning to, to feel like I need to make the preparations for the upcoming winter. At least in my part of the country, winter was a little bit rougher than usual on us with far more snow events. And one of the things that kept creeping up in the middle of winter is I wish I had known what I needed to do before all this mess got started, meaning the snow. So here we are, let's cover some of the details. We're going to talk about the adjustments you need to make to your particular housing situation, what you're comfortable implementing, and those things that you might be able to gradually implement. Dealing with those things that freeze, because we are talking about winter time and colder temperatures can lead to damage. Ammonia and ventilation are things that almost nobody ever remembers to think about. Not until it's too late and in your face, literally. What to do if you are not getting any more eggs from your chickens, things that you need to consider and, and how to troubleshoot that. And wintertime biosecurity. We always talk about biosecurity because it's always something that has to be a part of our thought process. So let's talk about what you need to do to change your wintertime biosecurity. And then something that nobody ever likes to talk about, but we need to consider it regardless, is frostbite and how it can affect your flock. All right, let's get started. So adjusting your coop means winterizing it. You're going to be dealing with cold temperatures. So if you've got a little bit of cash in your pocket and you're not willing to spend it on Christmas gifts or a big fancy turkey, consider insulating your coop. 
Look at the walls. Look at the roof. Are th is there already insulation in there? Could it do to have a little bit more insulation? Now, when I was a 4-H member, I had no idea how well my father had insulated our, our barn. Um, but I've learned over the years that you really have to take a good close look at the R value, which is the scale for heat and cold production for your insulation. And yeah, you may be thinking about it now for winter, but if you insulate now, you will absolutely get benefits from it in the summer as well. If you had to start anywhere, start with the roof. Number one, normally the chickens can't reach up that far and snag the insulation and potentially eat it. And number two, it'll help you in the summertime get that radiant heat off of your birds on the inside of the coop. Use the R value for your region and my next slide will actually break it down based upon the regions of the United States as to what you may need to invest in for your walls and for your roof. Think about different types of insulation. I fully realize that backyard flock owners have a variety of backgrounds and interests in recycling, upcycling, or investing in new materials. There are a lot of products out there and you don't have to go super fancy. But I will tell you this, whatever you put in there, if you don't cover it up, your chickens are going to eat it if it's on the walls and they can reach it. So it's really cheap to get the the blue or the pink foam stuff that um, looks like styrofoam and you can put it on the walls and it's going to do a good job. But your chickens are going to think that's great fun and they're going to eat it. So you're going to have to cover up whatever you choose to use, even if it's that recycled blue jeans material. If you if you're in in the part of the country that kind of shuts down construction um, in the next couple of months due to the weather, go around to different construction sites and see if they have just a little little extra that they don't mind giving you or selling you for a, a, a very affordable price. That's a way to upcycle some materials that might otherwise end up in a landfill. So. It's okay if they tell you no, or, well, just explain to them. Hi, I have a chicken coop and they had a real hard winter last year. Do you have any insulation that you're looking to get rid of that uh, you might be willing to give me or charge a, a, a nominal fee for? Well, the worst they could say is no, and it's not so bad if you get that answer. Just ask. Cover up anything that you put into the coop with, like, say, wood paneling, um, uh, 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 not, um, oh, I don't know why I can't think of the word. <laughs> Plywood, there we go. Uh, you can even cover it up with duct tape, just so they can't really get to it. I've even seen people use the, the feed sacks, but it all depends on what you want your coop to look like and if any of those are really an option for you. Oh, and as one of the uh, <laughs> participants in the chat room says, a case of beer goes a long way at construction sites. Good thinking, Spartman. Good thinking. All right. Let's look at where you may be in this great country of ours. I don't think many of our listeners are as far away as Hawaii or Alaska, but wouldn't that be nifty? Well, all the way over here in itty bitty teeny weeny little Delaware, we're in zone three. I know we have people from as far down south as zone four, Florida. Hey there, Joe Walter. And folks all the way up in Washington state at the opposite end of the country, also in zone three. So if you look over here at the chart in zone three, for your attic, which would be the same that you would use on your roof, you'd want an R49. For the wall, you'd want an R18. So for those of you who are in some of the colder parts of the, the Northeast or uh, Midwest, you may be looking at zone two. You might have to up your, your wall insulation to maybe um, 22. But your 
attic insulation will be also about the same. R49 is what you're looking at. Now, if you're in the very, very cold parts of, say, northeast Maine, the Dakotas, Wyoming, parts of Nevada, you're going to want to consider, hmm, all right, do I need to even up it even more? Do I need to go as, as thick as R28? Look and see what you can afford to do and gradually make the changes. Your chickens will thank you for it, even in the summer, as I said before. So hopefully I've given everyone sufficient time to take a look at where they are in this this map of the different zones and you can get an idea of what kind of attic and wall insulation R ratings you should invest in. For drafts, this is something that nobody seems to to think of in the beginning. Right now, before it gets too cold, go out into the coop at night with a lamp and plug it in or use a, a lantern of some sort, turn it on, place it inside the coop and shut the door. Then what you want to do is walk around your coop and anywhere where you see light creeping through any sort of gaps around the door or where you've got a window coming in, that's where you can get a draft. So you will want to consider wrapping the outside of your coop in clear plastic or even opaque plastic. This plastic comes in 4 millimeter thickness or 6 millimeter thickness. Sometimes they're referred to as 6 mil or 4 mil. And what you want to do is purchase this plastic at any of the what I call construction supply stores or um, like Home Depot or, or Lowe's. That's where I go to find this stuff. And you, everyone's coop's got different dimensions so you're going to have to buy as much as it takes to cover the outside of your coop. You can also include covering your run if you'd like, um, but that's up to you. Like say a, a very small roll, a 10 by 25 foot roll of what they call construction film. That's actually what you're going to go in the store and ask for is construction film. It's about $25. So I don't know. Um, Four mil never seems to last all that long, no matter how much care is taken in, in putting it up nicely and not tearing it throughout the winter and taking it back down. It always just seems to, to give way after about a year in my experience. And that's if you remove it and fold it up nicely and don't let any critters make nests in it in your storage spot or anything like that. I say put the plastic on the outside of the coop and the outside of the run because then you don't get any drifting snow into the run area, especially if you have a covered run, which is good biosecurity. And then they can go outside, enjoy the sunlight and, and moderate temperatures outside without having a ton of snow out there to kind of muddy up the run space. I use lathe and wood screws to hold the plastic in place and uh, that way it's a little bit easier to take it apart, fold the plastic up and put everything into storage for the summertime. Okay, I think I may be missing some questions. What square footage do I need per chicken inside a coop? Uh, and that's what we talk about when we're saying your chickens are cooped up in winter. You probably want about two square feet per bird, minimum. Um, so what kind of covering should I use on the run in the winter? I would say the six mil thickness. Um, it comes in clear, it comes in opaque, which is not see-through. It also comes in black, but um, uh, you can get whatever suits you best. One of your biggest challenges as small flock owners is going to get that coop dry as possible all the way through winter. Keeping the damp out of the coop is going to be your biggest challenge. And if you don't um, button up the run as well as 
the actual coop itself, then the chickens are just going to drag whatever mud they had on their feet from the run right back into your cozy coop. And that can also mean freezing temperatures right around those chicken entrances, which in some circumstances you might have to wait months before it thaws out enough for you to actually clean that adequately. And that can just be a yucky mess by the end of winter. So whatever you can do, maybe put a ramp that your, your chickens can kind of clean their feet off on moderately as they make their way from the run into the coop. Whatever you can do to keep that run as dry as possible will definitely benefit you and your flock in the long run. If you spill anything in the coop, clean it up immediately. That's another um, way for you to keep the damp out of your coop and ventilate your coop so you don't have um, just uh, just really stagnant air that's holding moisture in. It's one thing to wrap the outside of your coop in clear plastic, but you still need airflow in the coop. And we're going to talk about that when we discuss ventilation and, ventilation and ammonia control. So here's a couple of coops that have been buttoned up for the winter. You can see on the top picture they've covered the the run which is good biosecurity. They've winterized the run and sometimes you can get drifting snow so putting that plastic on the outside means that the snow is um, going to push on the plastic which will be supported by the chicken wire on on the uh, the walls of the run. Looks like there's also straw, deep straw inside there. Um, just remember you don't have to have the entire space covered, but you know which way the wind blows, where storms tend to blow from, and what side of the coop tends to get hit the hardest, and that may be where you need to focus your efforts um, for the time being. All right. Heat. This is a, a topic of much controversy. Bridget, before you do that, can you don't Bridget, have before you do that, can go you ahead. go back to the previous slide? There was a question about uh, lack of ventilation in the the top left hand picture. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. In this particular coop, they do have ventilation up towards the top where air can come out, but we're going to talk about areas that you may want to to modify in your coop to let air in um, on the side. I don't know if you can see my mouse at all when I move it around, Jackie. I'm not seeing it. Not. Did um, you click on the thing at oh, okay. the top? Where it says pointer up at the top? There's a little oh, tab that says that draw, that and then right next to it. Oh. Oh, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. So if you were to take, thank you very much folks. <laughs> so if you were able to uh, modify this coop a little bit and maybe put a little air inlet space in here um, and then you let heat rise and flow out then you can you can modify that. But we'll get to that particular um, topic in a moment. So, heat isn't necessary, but it will help you keeping your birds comfortable and prevent frostbite in the deepest, darkest, coldest parts of the nighttime. Um, you're going to want to have the heat turn on at night because that tends to be when it's coldest. Um, heat lamps are a cheap, affordable solution, but they can lead to fires. And I don't like to say this, but I have heard far too many times when heat lamps get knocked over, water splashed on them, they shatter, they start fires, they break, and then you either don't have a backup or the chickens just kind of have to suffer through the west rest of the winter. I'm here to tell you there are far better alternatives to heat lamps. If you are going to use a heat lamp, do not hang it by its electric cord. I do not prefer rope because again um, fire can be an issue. I like to hang them with chain 
and that way uh, if you have a mouse that comes along and decides to nibble on that rope and your heat lamp falls, well, they're not going to be able to nibble through a chain so easily. We had a question. At There's infrared heat heaters out. We had a question mm -hmm. on what temperature should you turn the heat on? Before it gets to freezing temperatures. So about 35 degrees. Um, if you want your if you want your heat to turn on at like say 40 there are adjustable programmable thermostats that you can um, purchase. Most chickens will decrease their egg production after the temperatures drop below 55 degrees Fahrenheit at night or consistently. Um, at some point you're gonna get down to a temperature where they're just gonna stop laying and that tends to be the teens and the single digits. Remember, egg laying is a bonus. That's one of the first things they're going to be giving up in favor of living. So if you can keep your temperatures, well, um, Christy and Mike said keep te inside temps at 55 degrees or higher. Well, once you start to go below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, some birds will decrease their egg production. That doesn't mean that all of them will stop immediately. You just might not get as frequent eggs as you are used to. So I really like infrared heaters. That way you're not heating the air, you're heating the bird. The Sweeter Heater is a product that I was able to test out and try out earlier this year. It hangs really well and that thing can put out the BTUs and it doesn't suck down your electric bill either. I've also looked at the Eco Glow, um, which is designed for um, starting chicks or brooding chicks because it's designed to sit on the floor. It's very stable when it's sitting on the floor, but it's not quite as powerful. It doesn't put out quite as much um, in the in the heat department. You could probably modify an Eco Glow if you already have one so that you hung it um, above your perch. That's where I would recommend that you put your sweeter heater or Eco Glow is above the perch. That's where they're going to be at night anyhow. So if you can kind of put that above where they're all perching then they can all kind of huddle together. A flat panel heater is available. They usually there's a few models that you can get at Walmart that just sit on the floor but as you all know things that sit on the floor can easily be knocked over so um, flat panel heaters um, yeah they're convenient but your heat's gonna go um, somewhat upwards I'm not sure you could and some of them can be awfully big I'm not sure you can make that work as well um, do you want to put a space heater in there? No, that's another fire hazard. Um, I think your safest option is an infrared heater. How much do they cost? It depends on what size you want to get. So go ahead and take a look at the Sweeter Heater website or the Brincy website which produces the Eco Glow product and take a, a look at what their sizes are for your options. Ours was about three feet uh, long and about 12 inches wide, and it it did the trick absolutely. So I think you can hear it in my voice. I am tickled pink with the sweeter heater. You could probably modify an Eco Glow to do the same thing, but right now, as their product stands, they really market it as something to brood chicks. So there you go. Take a look. Thermometers. A lot of people don't really know what temperatures are like in the coop. They don't spend the night out in their coop with their chickens. So if you really want to understand what your chickens are experiencing, keep two min-max thermometers out there in the coop. One next to the roost where they sleep at night and one someplace else in the coop, maybe near the feeder or the nest boxes, wherever you want. And then every day when you come in there, write it down on your clipboard and take a pencil in there into the coop and write it down. 
this is a good project for um, for high schoolers that are looking for science fair projects. You might be able to do some some research where you record the temperatures for a month and your egg production for that month and then you put in some sort of heating device in there and record the temperatures again and record egg production again. So there you go. There's a nice little project for anybody who has a, a high schooler who's interested in poultry. For thermostats there's a neat little product out there called a thermo cube. It turns on when the temperatures get down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. In the pictures over here, uh, there's two plugs on each thermo cube, but if you're running an extension cord out there, you'll just plug it in like a regular old grounded um, device. Thermo cube does make products, so if you need a fan to turn on in the summer, they have hot weather thermo cubes, and then this would be a cold weather thermo cube. And lots of temperature ranges, so check out whichever one would be most appropriate for your region of the country and how cold your, your winters tend to get. There are uh, adjustable thermostats. The J&D manufacturing thermostat um, has an adjustable dial, so it can turn on uh, when you have hot weather, so turning on a fan, or cold weathers when you need to turn on a heater. They're very durable. And yes, they're more expensive, but they really are a long-term investment. For this particular product down here, you're going to be able to only plug in um, one item unless you, you've got um, a splitter that you can add on there. But you're going to plug this into the wall and the thermostat will turn on whatever you plug in right here. Let's talk about things that freeze. So, of course, your litter or your bedding can freeze. You want to keep your litter deep, four to six inches. I really like six inches, and you want to keep it dry. So, if you tip the water over or you're scooping ice chunks out of the water and you knock them right onto the litter, you want to clean those up right quick before they start to add to your ammonia problem. Anywhere the chickens could track mud in, you're going to want to keep that spot cleaned. And something as simple as a, um, a doggy pooper scooper can scoop up little messes r very quickly. Watch your entrance doors for the chicken coop. If you couldn't get home quick enough to kind of lock the chickens in prior to a rain or snow event, you can get blowing rain or blowing snow that blow right into the coop and like I said earlier sometimes once it freezes that's what you gotta deal with until springtime so try to keep the door shut when you know that there's a a weather event coming up again make sure your birds have plenty of room so if they're going to be cooped up in the coop that they don't start picking on each other frozen eggs to avoid this, you want to pick up eggs two or three times a day. You want to have deep, clean shavings in the nest box. You want your nest boxes up off the ground where it's coldest in the coop. So heat rises and cold falls. If you keep your nest boxes about halfway up the wall, that's fine. Anybody who wants to hatch their own eggs, I do not recommend that you try to hatch completely frozen eggs it's um, not going to be worth your time. If you do have an egg that's feeling like it's started to freeze a little bit but it might be salvageable, you just want to warm those up slowly. Um, so get them into the house, get them into room temperature. Don't touch them after you bring them indoors. Let them come up to room temperature on their own. The less you handle them, the less likely the shell will crack because if the shell cracks then you're just going to have to dispose of them. Again, if they're cracked even in the slightest, you may not be able to salvage those eggs. 
Yes, again, Dr. Jacobs has put in there, um, I do not care for straw at all in the coop because it seems like no matter what you do, your ammonia levels are always going to be higher. And um, a lot of times my birds are feeling cooped up anyhow and the slickness of straw, you know, if they're chasing each other around, um, then they just seem to skid out more often and, and run into the wall as they're chasing each other around. Frozen waters. Well, your chickens, faithful egg layers that they are, lay eggs that are mostly water. So if you have frozen waters, don't count on a whole lot of eggs. Chickens tend not to break ice. Uh, that's something that you're going to have to do. The freeze-thaw cycle that can um, occur with the big plastic waters that have the um, several gallons, the white tops or the, the black handle white tops and, and red troughs, they, um, they tend to not make it through our winters so well. We usually go through here at the university one or two a winter because they don't handle the freeze-thaw cycle well. Uh, the metal waters with the heated water bases which are, oop, there we go, there's my arrow, um, identified right here, they work really well. Again, you have to have electricity. Well, if you don't have electricity out to the coop, consider a solar panel. Um, less water that you have to haul, thawed water that you have to haul out to the coop, um, the better off for you. Again, um, there are options if you if you want to you can run a hose out to the coop there are there are heated hoses uh, so you um, you screw the the end of the hose in to your water source and there's actually a cord a warming cord that's wrapped all the way around the hose so that it never freezes that's something for you to consider investing in and prices vary greatly I like nipple drinkers. Um, one of my favorite nipple drinkers is the um, is the chicken fountain. They have a heated water insert. They also have um, copper nipple adapters so that the actual nipples themselves don't freeze. Once you put the insert into the the um, the water, the copper. Uh, tabs, they tend to pick up the heat of the water and prevent the nipples from freezing themselves. Otherwise, if you have another type of nipple drinker, you may need to wrap it with heat tape or heat cable um, or insulating your water in some other fashion. Uh, but nipple drinkers are great for keeping things clean uh, throughout the winter time. And uh, again, they can be insulated and in, in like the chicken fountain, it ha you don't have to fill it back up, you just run a hose to it and if you use a heated hose, that's a step that you don't have to worry about that hose freezing. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about ventilation. We know that warm air holds more moisture and warm air rises, cold hair, air descends. Ammonia is a gas. It also rises. So in your coop, in the winter time, sometimes you, th you keep the, the coop closed up a lot more than you would in the summer, so you can get slightly higher ammonia levels. And the air can kind of um, be stagnant. What you want to do is provide a way for warm air to escape or vent itself. At the same time you want to provide an inlet for fresh air. So if you have a a chicken coop about halfway up the wall, if you had a little sliding inlet for fresh air to come in that you could um, increase or decrease the size on by sliding it open or closed as needed. Um, and you have a vent up at the top somewhere for the air to go, then the cold air will mix with the warm air <clears throat> and benefit your birds. 
if you're not sure how bad the ammonia is in your coop, um, consider getting uh, a little bit of um, ammonia tape. You just wet it with a little bit of um, distilled water that you can get at the grocery store and hold it in the coop and depending on how many parts per million you have of ammonia in the air it's going to give you a reading right here that you can compare it with. Your goal is to keep it at 20 or 25 parts per million or lower. Um, I like shavings uh, they're not always the most affordable, but they are very absorbent, and when you use the deep litter met method with spot cleaning, they can last longer. I've seen straw um, where in the coop the ammonia levels are just horrendous, but uh, I find that cheap bedding is cheap bedding. Um, you want your ammonia levels to be about 20 to 25 parts per million. And there is a new product out there. I've just learned about it. It's called Chick Flick. Uh, I mean, it's brand new out there. Um, they have chickflickcoop.com, and I think they have a listing of where you can buy Chick Flick, or you can ask for it at your feet store. But um, when we've done preliminary research, we've been able to um, show that it can get ammonia levels down fast within 30 seconds and it lasts for a week to a week and a half before you can reapply so if that allows you time to uh, allow for a thaw period so you can spot clean inside the coop all you would have to do is sprinkle a little fl chick flick on that little wet area that's producing ammonia maybe around the the door that goes outside and then when the temperatures go up you can go ahead and um, uh, spot clean but I'm fairly impressed with this new product. So looking at ammonia, with ammonia levels in the 20 to 25 parts per million area, <clears throat> in commercial production they really don't want you to exceed 25 parts per million because you can really affect the birds. Your feed ver conversion ratio is not as good and as birds are growing you can drop that final body weight down so think about what the ammonia levels are actually doing to your birds if you have ammonia levels that are very high you can actually cause inflammation of the eye so if you walk into the coop and we all stand several feet taller than where the chickens hang out when we walk into a coop if your eyes start to water, what are they experiencing down low? Put your face down there. Breathe that in for five minutes. If your eyes are watering or you start coughing and sputtering, maybe it's time for you to adjust your ventilation, consider some ammonia, ammonia mitigation strategies, grab yourself a bag of that chick flick stuff, and um, oh, to answer the question, what about sweet PDZ? It's not designed for use in poultry. So this new product I know has been designed specifically for use in small flock poultry. Um, and at super high levels you can actually really kind of hurt the birds long term if not uh, cause them to pass away. So what if your chickens this winter stop laying eggs? Now you're going to be troubleshooting. First of all, how old are your chickens? If they're in their first year, well, this, this, this first winter you can almost expect them to lay all the way through the winter if the temperatures are high enough and they're comfortable enough. If your birds are two or three years old or older, don't expect them to lay through their, their winter period because the days are shorter. Unless you add a light on a timer of sorts so that you're not paying a huge light bill. Unless you're providing at least 14 hours of light minimum, don't expect your birds to lay eggs. I think we just passed the, the autumnal equinox, so we're looking at a 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark nowadays. And you you want to 
add a light out there if you can or if you have a light from your garage that shines right on the coop and they get that light through the window you might want to click that light on for an hour or two after dark or if you're up early in the morning um, you can turn that light on in the morning but if mother nature is going to pay the light bill for 12 hours these days then you only need to pay for two extra hours of light whether you want that in the morning or the evening or you can split it both ways it's up to you so you're not getting any eggs well did your water freeze remember that egg is mostly water and if you had several days in a row where the water is freezing well the chickens aren't going to be able to produce eggs very efficiently so they may have cut off their egg production in favor of survival at any time did you run out of feed any sort of food and water disruptions are likely to affect your egg production is it getting just too cold for, for them to be comfortable we talked about the temperature below 55 degrees Fahrenheit and your productivity drops give them heat maybe they'll feel more comfortable and they may begin to lay eggs again but you might also have to add light to that mix if they stopped laying in their in their young year in their youngest year other things you need to consider is whether or not they may be sick you know does anybody sound like they have a raspy cough or like they have mucus in their throat um, you might have one of those illnesses where a drop in egg production is one of your first indications that you have a problem. Time to seek veterinary medicine assistance. Is there some other stress? Like say um, in, the, in the beginning of winter some of the juvenile predators really get aggressive and can really annoy and test um, your coop. Are they getting stressed out at night because a raccoon keeps harassing them? Or a fox? Or maybe you have a neighbor with a new dog and all they do is bark. That could stress your birds out. There, there are some other stressors that are affecting your birds. Let's talk a little bit about biosecurity. Dr. Jacob, are you handling some questions that I'm missing off to the side here? I am, yes. Okay. Um, when you think about biosecurity in the summer and in the moderate um, seasons, fall, spring, it's challenging enough to change what you're doing if you haven't already started biosecurity. So if you can get yourself into a biosecurity routine now in the fall before winter really hits you hard I'm gonna recommend you do it so for your dedicated clothing you're probably gonna need to add to that a hat scarf thicker or more insulated boots insulated coveralls if you can get your hands on them gloves um, the scarf and the gloves uh, probably aren't things that you're going to have for your dedicated um, clothing in the summertime. But make sure there's something that you feel comfortable washing on a weekly basis. So Aunt Maddie's old scarf that you always thought was just the most hideous thing and you're never ever going to wear that thing. Well, guess what? Your chickens may think that's the coolest scarf ever. And they'd appreciate it if you wore that out to them every day. So you want to wash and dry your dedicated wintertime biosecure clothing weekly. Think about your footwear and what mud might start to creep up right around the coop entrance, whether that be to the run or to the actual coop itself. If you can wash it off before entering the coop, you're going to do better. So if you have a scraper or something so you can get most of the caked material or wet snow off before you take your first step into the coop, great. Uh, maybe lay down some patio um, uh, concrete slabs so that you have a, a solid surface to kind of stomp the snow off your feet before stepping into the coop. Um, your foot bath should probably be on something that's solid uh, that isn't going to sink down into the mud because as soon as you step in that foot bath 
um, you're going to want to step off onto something solid. Keep a pond de-icer in your foot bath so that it doesn't freeze up on you. And yes, foot baths are a great idea any time of the year. Put a lid on your foot bath. So use a Rubbermaid bin, one of the low, low height Rubbermaid bins. Uh, put your pond de-icer in there and um, keep that at a decent temperature so that you can just step right in, scrub everything off, step out, and then move right into your coop. Watch for rodents in the winter. They're looking for a nice cozy place too. And the more cozy you keep your coop, ours is just a good a chance that you might be encouraging rodents to, to come for a visit. So keep a, a vigilant eye out for rodents. Lift things up, move things around, change the environment, um, as often as you can because rodents don't like change. They like everything to stay the same. So if you change things around and move things, then they might not be able to make a little nest somewhere in your coop. Somebody asked how to keep them out. And then if, how do you keep rodents out yeah. of your coop? Well, it depends on, it depends on your coop. You might be able to physically exclude them by, um, by closing doors. Uh, look for holes and cover them up with um, quarter inch hardware cloth and um, put out baits. Take care of the problem before you know before it gets out of control because it can get out of control fast. Will the chickens chase you want to have a um well, yeah, they'll chase them and they may eat them, but chickens may also eat mouse feces as well. And we all know all kinds of lovely things occur in mouse feces. Things that we don't want our chickens to have. <laughs> so if you have a mouse problem, it may be cool and nifty that your chickens are eating the mice, but they're also eating whatever the mice had as far as pathogens. So you need to really inspect your rodent control program. And that's another talk for another day, right, Dr. Jacob? Um, rodent control for, for backyard flock owners. Um, you, if you go away for the holidays and you have a house sitter, dedicate enough time to train your house sitter and how to confidently do all the steps of biosecurity. Post signs on how to use the foot bath and have them go through it with you once and see that they're comfortable doing all the things that you do to make sure that your flock stays healthy. And if they're a house sitter or a pet sitter that goes from farm to farm to farm, you may not be aware if they are visiting somebody's house who has a, a pet bird like a canary or a cockatoo or even other chickens. So that's something to consider. Let's talk lastly about frostbite. Frostbite in chickens can affect the comb, the wattles, and the toes, as you can see in this lovely picture here. Let's start with talking about the combs and wattles. You're talking about mostly roosters, but it can affect hens that have large combs. Large wattles can get wet when the chicken reaches down into the waterer, like say a trough water system, and they dip their wattles into the water. And then when they lift their head back up, the little dangly bits, uh, drops of water, hang out at the bottom of their wattles and that can freeze. What you're going to start to look for frequently, at least twice a week, is any sort of slight yellowing of the affected areas of the comb. So that be means for like a large single comb, all those points, if they have any slight discoloration to them, slightly yellow, and any wattles right down at the bottom, um, if they start to look yellow. Uh, prominent yellowing means that you had a really bad frostbite incident. That will soon turn to black sections and you may lose part of the wattles or the tips of that comb. To prevent this, you might want to uh, coat the comb and the wattles in Vaseline, which is petroleum jelly, 
it's not a guarantee. Your better bet is to warm that coop up. Um, otherwise, if there are people listening that haven't started their, their flocks yet, choose breeds with smaller combs, like say a rose comb or a pea comb or a cushion comb. Those smaller combs stay closer to the bird's head and the incidence of frostbite is slightly less. Uh, birds can lose a large section of their comb and it is not pleasant for them. You may actually have to remove those birds to your quarantine area as they recuperate. Um, and that quarantine area should be place, a place that's a little bit warmer for them. To prevent frostbite on toes, you want perches that are very wide so that the toes don't necessarily curl all the way around a perch. You want those toes to stay close to the bird's body. A lot of the times if you watch chickens go to roost, the hens will lift up or the, even the roosters will lift up their breast feathers and cover their toes as much as possible with those breast feathers as those toes curl around the, the perch. If you do have an incidence of frostbite on the toes, you're going to see birds that are limping. It can be confused with bumblefoot, so catch that bird and pick them up and take a good close look at them. Um, so taking something like a, like say a four by two uh, uh, piece of lumber and rounding the edges on one side will help provide the birds a nice wide solid base for them to perch on and um, you know that way they they can get those those toes up close to their body if you have frostbite seek veterinary care um, walking and balance issues can become a problem because sometimes those toes have to come off so let's not get in that situation in the first place it's not fu something fun that we like to think about So that concludes my talk. I left a few minutes for answering questions and yes you can knit your chickens a little something to keep them warm in the winter. Being a knitter I thought that was awfully cute. Any questions? There was a thing on um, round versus flat perches on backyard chickens. Mm. Uh, backyard chickens the the e extension? No, thing? I think it's the backyardchickens.com. They're having a debate on oh, round okay. versus flat perches. <laughs> um, if you can, if you can change them out for the winter, you, that's great. But I would say in the winter time, you want those toes as close to the body as possible. Any sort of perch that you choose should also be easy to clean. So paint your perches if you can, so they're easy to disinfect. Not that you're going to be doing much disinfection in the middle of winter, but when you do spring cleaning. So the question <laughs> is, should it change 2x2s two two for 2x4s? Two by um, 2x2s two by are... Hi, are we talking... We're, we're talking to uh, yeah. Spartman. Um, Spartman, I have a question for you. Do you have bantam fowl or large fowl? Hopefully large fowl. I'd go two by fours. I think your birds will be more comfortable. Anybody have any other questions? We have uh, five minutes left. Uh, there's a question about buying started pullets. Is it safe to ship them from Texas to New In the York? Winter? In the winter, I'm not sure that's a good idea. A lot of postal service won't even ship when it gets cold. Yes, they can lose their claws if they freeze their feet. Um, sometimes whole sections of toes have to be amputated. That's why I said seek veterinary care. Because that needs to be done properly for the benefit of the bird. The so bantam lay as much as large. Not usually. They're not selected no. for it. They are not selected for it. <laughs> um, they lay smaller eggs and they lay fewer eggs. Yeah. Huh. 
And Bantam is just a size. It's not a breed name. Size matters. <laughs> <laughs> we got a few more minutes. Do you address more frequent egg collection in the winter? Yes, I did. What's the best heritage break for um, egg laying? <laughs> That's a good debate. I'd like to get some more grants to answer that question. Me too. <laughs> We have a lot of success. With Sounds like it's time for us to team up. <laughs> we have a lot of success with the uh, Bard Rocks and the uh, um, Rhode Island Reds. And here in Delaware, we had a farmer try out Delawares, and they did much better than Americanos. Yeah, you did a webinar on that. Uh, yeah. What is a nice beginner? Should I plug up my roof vents and insulate it then? I would say... Um, for Spartman, it, don't plug them all up. You want the air to come out at some intervals, but um, uh, insulate your roof, yes. we got a couple more minutes if anybody has any pressing questions for Bridget. And uh, while you're typing in any questions, if you have, the next webinar is in October, October 21st, another evening one on the uh, basics of poultry processing so we go from uh, egg production to meat production and um, we have uh, somebody from uh, Penn State University who's going to be discussing how to process chickens and turkeys I don't think she's going to talk about waterfowl because everybody has trouble with waterfowl but if you want to bring up the question feel free to do so and then in November, we start our small egg production flock series with cost evaluation of different housing systems. Uh, oh, we have a question. What kind it's, of flooring? Uh, what kind of flooring would work better in the winter, dirt or gravel? I'm assuming you mean in the coop? Inside the coop, I would say, um, I, I would have to say you need to have bedding uh, down over any sort of flooring. Uh, so you have a dirt floor coop. Well then you're going to want to have probably oh you're probably going to want to have in excess of six inches. Um, gravel I I don't like sand or gravel because they hold a lot of water and then they're just <laughs> heavy. Um, Dr. Jacob, do you want to ask any of our listeners what subjects they would like to hear in the future? What might that be of interest to them? That would be a good question to ask. Anybody have any uh, pressing topics that they would like as I'm starting to work on the next year's um, webinar series? Yeah, straw is not a good We're one. listening. <laughs> no, straw is just, don't use straw Especially for your poultry. Especially not It's duck. just... Yeah, no. <laughs> we actually... <laughs> what to look for in a chicken tractor? Okay. We Raising actually did fowl. one on guinea fowl. Um, it ended up with technical difficulties. We should try to redo that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Nest boxes. Lots of good nest boxes. So that will probably be covered in the uh, egg production series. The five... Um, what, what specifically do they want with nest boxes? interesting to know. Community policies for backyard chickens. How to build support for chicken raising. That's always a good one. Well, that's one that I can address. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just volunteered myself for you one, did, didn't you I? Did one, uh, a while back on, um, what was it? Well, that was for community right. gardens. But this is more for changing laws, I think. I think. Had, I, right, Christy and Mike? I think we had one on... Um, was it called developing um, what's the last thing called establishing regulations for keeping backyard poultry it was one that we had uh, right after year one on the community garden so uh, mm. sexy poultry is difficult and there's a whole chapter on that in my my book just Ch chicken whisper guide to raising chickens well it's eight o'clock everybody so uh, time is up um, about housing developments and communications. You know, we've got lots of good topics. I will have to 
review this later and come up with some uh, some more topics. Thank you uh, for the clap there, Pam. Appreciate it coming in from Washington State. So thank you guys very much for coming, and I hope we'll see you next month when we discuss processing chickens. Thank you very much, Bridget. You did a great job. Thanks for moderating. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.